Oh gosh, look at the crowd. Come this way. Those who spread goodness radiate happiness to everyone around them. Introducing LOLC Finance Credit Cards. Fuel the goodness in you. Welcome to LMD TV. I'm Ashni Vedakan and this week on Talking Business, joining me is activist, public speaker and cause marketing consultant, Shanaki D. Alvis. Welcome to the show, Shanaki. Good to have you with us. Thank you. Now in a recent video for Women's Day by Living Magazine, you say, and I quote, I know it's hard, I know it's confusing, but trust me on this one, you have to stay the course. Could you just elaborate on this? Um, okay, so I, like a lot of Sri Lankan girls, uh, conditioned in this society, we do tend to uh, sort of um, struggle a bit, I think, with our identity, with our autonomy, uh, with our sense of independence. And um, in, in doing so, like in my life especially, I did rebel against certain, uh, in certain environments where I felt trapped. And, um, and in doing that, I might have made, you know, not so safe choices, wrong choices. And as women, you know, there are lots of things where we beat ourselves up a lot and we blame ourselves for a lot of things that go wrong because we're too young, we're too impressionable and naive and nobody has really told us that it's not our fault. You know, and we tend to sort of take on the, whatever the exploitations of the world that come on us, uh, that uh, we tend to think it's our fault or that we have some part to play in it. So. I did struggle with that kind of thing. Um, and as such, you know, where there were certain times where I second guessed myself. I wondered if I was doing the right thing, if I was being who I needed to be, or was I just living to somebody else's expectations? Um, and so there is a lot of identity struggle and uh, charting your course because the world is telling you to do something, but your heart might be telling you to do something else. Uh, so that was what the message meant, really, the struggles that you go through emotionally, psychologically, that um, you will struggle. But at the end of the day, what you learn as you grow older is that these are all lessons and these all kind of are part of building your foundation into who you will become. So it's just stay with it, stay with whatever your heart is telling you to do and stay with your convictions. As far as gender balance at the workplace goes, Shanuki, are you in favor of affirmative action? meaning some forms of quota of senior management level. And what would be the pros and cons of this? So this is a tricky one, right? And I know that the, a lot of the usual argument or the demand from the feminist movement is you must have a quota. But for me, it's more about you must have meritocracy. And uh, it shouldn't be about appointing women into managerial positions simply because they are women, because I, I think that would be also unfair by women, but by not sort of uh, recognizing us for skill, talent, intelligence, and what we bring to the table, but simply because of your gender. And I don't think that's the way to go about it either. I would hope that in the future that uh, appointments made promotions or uh, in, in empowerment is based on what, you, what value you add. Um, as opposed to what gender you are, it shouldn't be about gender. But if the way to get there is right now to have a quota to ensure that women are given that space, uh, because right now we have a very patriarchal, very chauvinistic system, um, then I suppose the quota works. But I would say that eventually it shouldn't be about a quota at all. And where do you stand on labor exports? Isn't it time that we rethink this given that thousands of our women end up in regions like the Middle East and our nation celebrates this as a huge forex earner? What is your take on this? So here's the thing. I don't think this country can survive without the income of uh, the labor exports uh, economically. And I think uh, that's a very difficult position to be in. We can't stop sending labor out because the country cannot survive. But uh, it, it is the what kind of labor are we sending out? What kind of um, upskilling are we giving? Because these are women who know nothing. They are exploited because they know nothing. Uh, we, we take their money or we take their trust and we send them overseas without giving them the necessary skills, without giving the necessary understanding of their rights, without giving them the tools to protect themselves or uh, really 
Um, so they go there in a very impressionable, completely ignorant state. Then they go and they work for people who are disappointed with their service because the quality of skill um, is not up to mark. So for me, I would say it's not about stopping labor exports. It, it's what kind of labor exports are we sending? So we should not be sending slaves and domestic workers. Sri Lanka should not ideally be the country that's known for sending domestic workers overseas. Whereas we can, if we can invest on our women, on empowering our women and upgrading skills so that we send out skilled workers for various industries. I mean, there's all, all sorts of other things that women can do. They don't need to go and clean houses and look after babies. Not that they're not good at it. Uh, but um, I, I think that's where we need to be investing, not about stopping people going abroad, but in what capacity are they going? And then if we are creating qualified, skilled uh, female workforces, then they are also far more empowered and entitled when they go into positions where they have dignity in their work. And uh, then they're also contributing a lot more to the country and the country on a whole, the image, the recognition that the, the country gets for the quality of work we're sending out, all that improves. So I think that's where we need to be really uh, looking at it. And I believe the Ministry of Justice is also working on something uh, on a plan that similar, it just needs all stakeholders to be in on this game. Would you agree that we need to sort problems faced by women in the workplaces here at home first? First and foremost, yes. I, I don't think there's anybody who would disagree with that. Um, I think the whole, there needs to be an entirely new attitude and a shift in this country. The patriarchy needs to be dismantled from its roots. Systems and infrastructures are not female friendly. And uh, it is not even prioritized anymore. I mean, we don't even have a state ministry uh, for women anymore. And I think given that you have 52% of your population uh, and your GDP coming from like the female workforce largely and the women being the backbone of your country, uh, the fact that you can't even afford a state ministry to take care of their very special unique needs and grievances, I think that's very telling of what we need to do. We'll be going in for a short break right now. Welcome back to the show as we continue our discussion with Shalaki Diabis. Continuing on the manufacturing sector, do you believe enough is being done to provide the required amenities to sustain a female workforce? So, uh, so this is not an informed opinion. It's simply a personal opinion because I don't come from the manufacturing industry. So I don't have an in-depth insight or any empirical data or evidence to support anything that I'm saying. Uh, I do know that in policy, a lot of the private manufacturers and a lot of the large organizations do have facilities uh, that they have put in place. We do have like the garment manufacturers and all that. They talk of uh, crash facilities. They talk of uh, the maternity leaves, flexibilities and all that for their women. And there are some forerunners who are doing the right thing. Uh, I don't know if it's at its ideal. I think we do have a long way to go. I think there's a lot of uh, understanding and sensitization that organizations, especially in the manufacturing uh, field, need to have about the mental health of the women that, who work in those uh, situations. It's not just about giving them a crash to put their babies in. It's about dealing with everything else that those women have to deal with in their lives as well. Uh, understanding things like women's health, reproductive rights, sexual health, I mean, uh, the discrimination, that all that, the, the, the sexual exploitation that happens, we hear these stories from the manufacturing industry especially. So I don't think uh, when you say facilities and amenities, it shouldn't be about physical 
mm-hmm. infrastructure that's you know a, a space she can go to or leave she can take that's very much a part of what she needs but there's so much more and i think we need to go there as well let's take working from home what do you consider the pros and cons for working women especially working moms so the pros are that she is at home so she is able to take care of her other responsibilities and not stress about the fact that she is not around her kids and that uh, the stuff that she needs to get done at home are met um the cons are obviously the the stress she will undergo in having to juggle everything i mean it's going to be very difficult for her not to have that uh, space set out for herself to, like she would in an office environment the, the kind of psychological distance or so that she creates between home life and work life to be able to focus and be productive with the work um obviously it gets very difficult because a lot of employers take it for granted working from home uh, means okay then whatever hour of the day that you should be on call and available and there is i think the work from home model has to be looked at responsibly by employees or employers also so that she is able to manage her time and i think in a work from home environment again it's about the gender equality the the um, fathers also contributing equally to the home responsibilities so that it's not on her the onus is not on her to make everything happen now as much as she is going to be working from home he also needs to be contributing equally so that she has her time she has her space and she has her independence outside her uh, identity as a mother and a wife to be the working woman also so i think it's uh, on the, yeah it's it's on her it's on the family and it's on the employer to work together to create a model that works best for her and gives her whatever room to rest also in the, in the middle of it if they are able to figure that model out a lot of women would opt for working from home because they feel like they are able to then give what they need to give to their children and their home as well and uh, nobody is asking this question from the men i want to ask that question like why is it that nobody is asking this question about men like how is it a good or a bad thing for you to work from home why because they don't share the responsibilities that she does how important is it that young women have role models to learn from and perhaps emulate see okay can i give you a slightly long answer here and i know it's a, i think it's good for any woman to have someone who they can look up at as a guidance on how that person overcame struggles or what that person's journey was but i think where we get it wrong is when we say role model we try to emulate someone we try to be that person when we grow up right and then you forget that you also have something unique you also have a journey that might be special to you you want to be like that person and you start to sort of imitate rather than working on you uh, and i think a lot of role models that we look up to they charted their own course and i think that's what we need to take from them uh to to use them as role models simply as inspiration for the fact that you can get to where you want to go so as long as we uh, teach our young ladies to look at it that way i think it's important to have women figures who we can uh, use as those guiding lights shalaki what more can the private sector do to create a level playing field for both women and men this might seem a little uh, maverick and rebellious of me but i think the zero tolerance of discrimination and sexism is a must meaning if there is a male in a senior position no long no matter how successful and good he is for a company if he is toxic in terms of his views on gender and in terms of how he treats females in the workspace he should be gotten rid of it doesn't matter if he's bringing you the billions into the company if you want to create a safe inclusive and uh, equal space there should be absolutely zero tolerance of that kind of thing in the office men and women both whoever is upholding the patriarchy needs to be gotten rid of i don't know how realistic that is for lots of companies because they're more worried about the bottom line than they are about 
their social capital, I think. Well, this has been a real insightful conversation. Thank you so much for joining us this evening, Shanuki. Thank you for having me. After a short break, we return with the latest LMD Nielsen Business Confidence Index. Stay tuned. Our story is one of reimagining. Reimagining who you can be, what you can achieve, and how SEMA can support you. As technology and digital platforms disrupt businesses, we are reimagining what the profession can be. We've updated our syllabus to meet the expectation of employers, ensuring SEMA qualified professionals have the skills to make an impact from day one. Reimagine your career. Contact SEMA Sri Lanka. Welcome back to the show, I'm Ashwini Vedakan. As base sentiment goes, 2020 had its ups and downs. The LMD Nielsen's Business Confidence Index oscillated between a high of 174 basis points at the beginning of the year, fell progressively thereafter against the backdrop of an unprecedented pandemic until August, when it bounced back to above the century mark, only to shift into reverse gear and end the calendar year at a lowly 83 on the BCI scale. Since then, however, there has been a welcome turnaround largely as a result of the news of Sri Lanka's immunization program and a hope that efforts to mitigate the deadly virus will succeed sooner rather than later. The BCI's January score of 122 is followed by two-point dip a month later to 120 in February, a sign perhaps that the unique index has stabilized as the government set a target of vaccinating sufficient numbers of the citizenry to reach the so-called herd immunity that humanity desires in the first half of 2021. As Nielsen's Director of Consumer Insights, Tarika Mianadeniel cautions, The COVID-19 situation has not abated in Sri Lanka and new cases as well as deaths continue to rise. In spite of this, Sri Lankans are bravely foraging ahead cautiously in order to salvage their businesses which were badly hit in 2020. The most pressing issues cited by business people include the impact of COVID-19, followed by inflation and the unabated spread of bribery and corruption. On the national front, corporate executives cite the spread of the virus and the economic outlook as being the priorities. In addition, the plight of children with regards to their education has emerged as being a cause for concern. With a new and more virulent strain of the virus identified in Sri Lanka and an increased rate of infection and deaths, Mina Denia believes that the hope of the country getting back to normal is somewhat muted. She opines if this trend continues, there is a possibility of both indices, the BCI and Nielsen's Consumer Confidence Index, will plummet again. While this continues to hold true, the pace and effectiveness of Sri Lanka's immunization program is likely to drive sentiment in the near term, along with whether or not the ongoing spread of COVID-19 persists. The outlook beyond Sri Lanka will also drive sentiment this year given an interconnected world relies on international supply chains, travel and markets, and all of which are presently under a cloud. As for the economy, the outlook for the 12 months ahead is being viewed with less optimism than a month ago according to the results of the latest monthly LMD Nielsen Business Confidence Index poll. Less than 3 in 10 business executives consulted for the survey in February feel the economy is likely to improve in the next 12 months, as opposed to the 43% that said so back in January. For the record, nearly half of those polled six months ago were upbeat about the economy in the immediate aftermath of the general election. In the meantime, slightly less than a quarter of respondents, compared to around a fifth in the previous month, believe the economy will get worse in the 12 months ahead, while the remainder, that's nearly half the survey sample, are of the view that the economic environment is likely to stay the same. While the long-term prospects for businesses are likely to improve, according to the latest BCI survey, the shorter term continues to be viewed with caution. Over three quarters, which for all intents and purposes is no different to the outcome in January, of respondents anticipate sales volumes to increase this year, while less than one in ten point to flagging prospects during this time. This represents an improvement from six months ago when roughly two-thirds of those polled expected higher sales in the 12 months ahead. 
As for the next three months, 37% versus the 34% in the prior month of survey respondents state that sales volumes will improve although the majority, 50%, as in the prior month, of the sample population contend that biz prospects are likely to stay the same. In the February survey, 19% of the survey sample compared to last month's 20% paint the prevailing investment climate in the country in a positive light. That means they view the outlook as being good or very good. In contrast, however, a notable 64% from around half a month ago of those consulted by the posters believe that this is not a good time to invest and another 17% described the prevailing investment climate as being fair. The share of corporates planning to increase their staff numbers in the coming six months has plummeted from over a fifth in the preceding two months to only 12% in February. This is closer to the 15% that said so in September last year. That said, a clear majority of 76% from 68% in the previous month expect to maintain their workforce numbers while a further 12% versus 11% in January say they will resort to staff cuts in the next six months. That's all we have for you this week. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you for watching and stay safe.